Hi friends, how are you? Uh, today I am attempting to fix a watercolor painting that I did a few months ago. Well, at least I started it and then I think I lost the picture I was working from and then I found it again. Uh, but in the meantime, oh, I'm using a sponge. Um, I want to tell you, I've been having trouble stretching this watercolor paper. Uh, so I bought the sponge to help me uh, just to get the right amount of water and remove any excess because um, I bought this, first I was using a, a coated board and the tape wasn't sticking to it so as soon as it would dry it would like come off the board and then I couldn't, it wasn't stretched anymore. So I bought this maple panel um, and I've had trouble with the paper actually sticking. I think the glue from the tape is like running into the paper. So I'm using a sponge now and also trying to apply the water to the paper tape with a sponge instead of literally dipping it in the water because uh, I'm hoping that that will help uh, alleviate the problem. Um, and it did. It worked. Uh, I'll show you at the end. I was able to cut it off and it didn't stick to the board. So um, also it's should, I would say, if you're stretching paper, you should always leave. I can see I have a little, it's not completely flat over there. And you'll have to excuse me. I'm eating a bowl of ice cream. I'm on a break while I'm doing this. So, but I'm giving you this for free so just bear with me so here's a photo of a painting I did when um, using this method that stuck to the board and so I can't even sell the painting I'm gonna probably uh, try to repair it and uh, yeah it's just really sad but the whole thing was I had to actually wet it and then use a razor to peel it off but it got several little holes in it and then you can see how torn up the back of it is so that's why I decided hmm because it's stuck like all the edges of the paper are stuck and that's what uh, tore off that I need to use a sponge to make sure I'm getting all the excess water okay here's the photo that I'm working with we're gonna try to bring out some of those whites now and here I'm using actually three yellows, an Indian yellow, a cadmium yellow, and an Aurelian yellow, which is a transparent yellow. Uh, so I just decided uh, for the yellow iris and then the green blossoms that I would do that. I'm also using a vintage green that I got from Holbein that's no longer available. It's some sort of antique color that they, you can see it there. Uh, that they were discontinuing so I got it on sale and I really like it actually it's uh, based on a Chinese pigment uh, from like hundreds of years ago there it is you can see it on my palette all right and uh, then these are some gouache an orange and a white gouache that I'm going to use to build up the whites because uh, I'm going to have to and for many Obviously, it's better to not to to leave the white white when you're painting with watercolor. But since I've already gone too dark in the areas that should have been lighter and had the highlights, I'm going to have to go go back with the gouache, which is opaque and will cover up. So, in a lot of circumstances, this kind of fix wouldn't be a good idea. Say maybe if you're doing a portrait, but for these flower petals, it's actually going to build up to a nice effect, I think. So now I'm just trying to delineate and um, accentuate the edges of the petals, which is where the most of the yellow is. And it's also quite roughly. And um, I also have a lot of harsh water lines of where the water dried the first time. So I'm going to try to um, loosen that up again and then... Um, like I said accentuate the lines also create more shadow area because there's a lot more shadows um, these leaves are a challenge I think even more than a rose because there's so many 
uh, variations in the shapes and in the uh, shadows and uh, just some uh, real intricate uh, detail with the ruffling of the petals. And just, you know, you could definitely go a lot tighter um, and just more hyper photo and realistic. Um, and it would probably, I think these bearded iris are a great project for that kind of art uh, with watercolors. Um, but since I've already got this down and I'm trying to repair it, it's still going to be fairly loose and a loose interpretation of them. And uh, so I've, I've had requests not to speed up painting so people can see me putting down the brush strokes. I prefer speeding things up just because I'm from that generation, the ADHD type. Uh, I was always hyper as a kid. Um, and I just, nowadays people are even, I listen to some podcasts and um, I used to speed them up, but I actually have podcasts now that I listen to that they are speeding them up. So you don't have to, and um, they, they do it in a way where they don't sound like a chipmunk. I'm not sure how they do that, but uh, yeah, so uh, it seems to be kind of the thing, just it's such a fast paced world, but I'll try to talk through this uh, at, and give you as much information while you're watching as possible. And I'm still planning to do speed painting as well. Uh, but this time we're going to do just uh, real time. I did edit out some times when I was mixing since you can't see my palette. Uh, I figure why I uh, just have all that uh, dead space, I should say. Maybe not dead, but, um, you know, just staring at uh, this picture while I'm off camera. So... Uh, I did cut out a little bit of that, and that shortened the video. So in real time, I probably spent just as much time mixing off the camera, out of the camera's view. And so it would have been twice as long. And also, I had done the work on this painting before. Uh, and I also have gone back several times to let the layers dry on this video so you don't get that when you see that this video is 24 minutes long you're not <clears throat> getting the fact that I let the layers dry that I um, did a lot of mixing and uh, even pausing to think and plan uh, while I was adding paint and then again like I said um, there's a whole other video I could have done on the making of the bad painting but th that we're trying to correct here. And actually, uh, so what's really making the best difference are these shadows. So let's get back to the talk of the painting. And uh, it's really giving it, uh, making it start to uh, become three-dimensional and jump off the page and go back into space. So this is really important, especially when you're dealing with whites. I've noticed with white flowers, they're not just white. And I've, I'm really working, I've done some white flowers with oil paints and it's the same situation. When you are painting whites, it's never just white. It's got all kinds of colors in it and a lot of times, I mean, nearly black shadows. And uh, so it's just really important to um, to get into your right side of your brain if you've been watching my sketching videos and uh, really look at what you're seeing and not be in your logical brain that's saying, well, this is a white flower and it's a white petal, but say, um, but actually it's in shadow here, so there is no white. You don't see any white. All you see is a dark shadow that's barely even got color in it. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. So the middle of this iris, um, it was mostly in shadow, and then there's like a really bright orangey-yellow center. Uh, which was like a little ruffled center and so I'm just building that up 
and starting to put on the whites. And I feel kind of sad uh, because the, um, the gouache covers up a lot of the uh, variations that you get with the the watercolor which is my favorite part of watercolor is just the flow and um, there's really a loss of control with watercolor I, I mean when you're really experienced you you get it but when you're a beginner I think it's so fun because you just it's so amazing to see what the paint does when um, it's like a science, like a, a child science project where you put paints in water and then you mix them. <clears throat> and so here, um, if you see, I really like what happened there on the petal where the orange, the orangey red on the left side is bleeding into the white. That gives a really nice touch, I think. Um, but it's important with the gouache, uh, like I said, it's covering up a lot of the uh, the nice watercolor underneath so that's the part you have to really be careful about but I think it works well with these petals it gives a nice effect you're getting the highlights but I still am letting a little bit of uh, the transparency show through um, and with these petals it seems to work well I'm not sure again how well it would work with like a portrait um, especially trying to correct a portrait but um, mainly if the bones of a painting I'm I'm realizing which a lot of times has to do with the drawing uh, and the composition that you can even with watercolors I had no idea that you could really uh, correct a lot of things but um, yeah it's possible it might not be exactly what you were going for but sometimes you know happy accidents happen so here I'm just taking away some of this, that um, burnt umber there, or uh, transparent earth in the corner is, uh, you know, with the bearded iris, there's a lot of, like, that was like um, a dead, maybe a dried on the vine type of thing. It just uh, is like a papery brown uh, flower that never actually got out of the bloom and but it's really dried and already turning lost its color and turning brown and I like the fact that it's adding a little interest and variation to the painting just that pop of rusty red up in the top corner and even that drop that's one of the fun happy accidents I really like with watercolor is um, it just is like oh hey this is a watercolor painting and so I actually really like it when I see sometimes drops of color. It's just, um, to me, adds to the whole element and uh, fun of the painting. So it looks like we're almost done here. Let's see. You know what? We're still going to go build up some of these layers for a few more minutes here. So uh, what can we talk about if you're still here? Thanks for watching. And I didn't put music. I've had some people say they can't hear me when I'm, I've got the music on. <laughs> so I've uh, decided sometimes I'll still do it, um, but I like kind of having the beat in the background and but I can understand if people can't hear very well. So I'm, if I do add music, I'm trying to t do music that doesn't have lyrics or voices if I'm talking over it. And then also um, just turning it way, way down so that it's barely audible. And then turning my voice up so that it's uh, definitely uh, something that you can hear and understand. And I am trying to also speak distinctly and uh, my bowl of ice cream honestly is nearly a puddle here. I'm going to just take one break and have a, a little um, bite of my now it's chocolate soup. <laughs> Mm, 
<clears throat> okay, so I'm just really now using this white gouache to bring out the the highlights and the whites of the petals. And it has to be done very subtly. And uh, so this one right in front, I'm not working on it, but I can see I need to blend that a little bit. But uh, yeah, there are some hard lines, like the one right at the top of it, which is curved towards the center of the flower. That actually is what it looks like because that's where the leaf folds over. Uh, but the, the rest of it needs to blend in with the yellow a little better, so I'm going to work on that next. And then I think I even... Um, yeah, right here I'm going to even go deeper with the shadow area because that's what there is. There's a lot of shadow area right here under these leaves. Okay, we're going to go up here again, it looks like. I really do like the organic quality of the transparent earthy colors. So whenever I'm painting flowers, I like to have uh, some of these earthy colors. Ochres, uh, sienna, burnt sienna, and definitely the transparent iron oxides. Uh, usually an orange is my favorite. Uh, but there's reds and yellows also. So what else is on my palette? I think I have ultramarine blue and um, like a Queen of Cridone. It's a Chevra. Let me see. I don't know how they say that in the old Holland. Let me go get it. Excuse my... Uh, Pronunciation, Shevenenengen, <laughs> uh, Rose Deep. So uh, that is on my palette. Just because I'm working with yellows, I wanted to uh, have the opposite, which would be a nice purpley color, uh, which if I mix this rose with, uh, uh, it's a very transparent rose or a cool red with, uh, the ultramarine, it makes a nice purpley color. And you don't see that on my palette, but I'm using it um, to tone down my yellows. And at the end here, I'm using a lot of the Aurelian yellow, which is kind of like a, reminds me of a nickel yellow. It's a very cool, but it's transparent, like cobalt blue, but it's like a yellow uh, with the same... Uh, tones in it. All right, again, just building up layers. I've let this dry a couple times since we started. Oh gosh, it's so late at night when I'm finishing this. So this is under uh, just my overhead light in my basement studio. And then I have an incandescent. Um, it might be, it's like a three-way bulb. So I don't know if those are incandescent or LED. Um, so it might be a little cooler light. But I just have that hanging off to the side. I have some purple iris in my bearded iris in my yard that aren't up yet. It's a little cool still here in Chicago. Uh, but I'm excited to paint those when they finally bloom because... Um, those were um, from my great-grandmother, who's uh, now gone, uh, her garden. And so it's kind of cool to carry on those uh, same flowers that my grandmother had at her house. All right, I'm going to finish my ice cream, so excuse me for a minute. I've only got a few bites left. All right, so I was eating Oberweiss chocolate ice cream, and then I also got Dean's black walnut. If you've never tried black walnuts, it's kind of a Midwest thing, but 
and they're very strong tasting. They're like a wild, uh, got a lot of tannins in them. More than English walnuts, they for some reason remind me of my childhood because growing up um, in Indiana and Illinois, uh, family in Ohio, Missouri, I mean, we're just in black walnut country, that and uh, persimmons, but these aren't the same persimmons that you they grow in California that you can just eat out of the palm of your hand. No, these ones have to almost like rot and they're still not edible, You, but we make puddings with them and cakes and um, you have to make them into a pulp before you can really use them. And uh, so that's something I grew up with too as a Hoosier and a Midwesterner. And uh, so, yeah, I saw the black walnut ice cream in the store and I had to get it. Even though Dean's isn't my favorite brand, I do kind of like the higher end premium ice creams. But uh, there's not many companies that make black walnut ice cream. Okay, so just uh, to finish up here, we're coming around the bend toward the finish line, and I'm just adding some details like that little, uh, trying to add some little bit of detail. I feel like it's still a little too abstract, and, and um, uh, just trying to delineate the edges of... Uh, the leaf sections. I guess that's what you'd call them. You know, I would, doing all these flowers has made me get interested in biology and horticulture and um, learning more. I have to tell you, if you paint things, it's a really great way to learn about something. Uh, you get so intimate with something. Uh, just, I mean, like this iris here. Um, it's one thing to look at an iris from a distance, but when you're painting something close up like this, it really gives you an appreciation. You can see, you know, all its reproductive stem in and um, where the pollen gathers and uh, just the, the leaf structures and uh, seed pods and uh, like these leaves here and just how some are in different stages. We've got some open and some that are uh, on their way to opening and one that, like I said, dried in the uh, stem. So uh, it's not going to open. So, I, and it makes me wonder, you know, how does the plant choose which ones are going to bloom, which ones aren't. So all these new questions uh, just by painting flowers. Uh, and it's the same when I paint birds or um, other objects. That's one reason I do like painting everyday objects because they're things that are often overlooked. And uh, it's a really nice meditation and you can actually learn a lot by uh, just stopping and smelling the flowers, so to say, or and I should say paint the flowers. We've got some jets going overhead. Okay, so uh, here we go. This is the final product. The next morning I took these photos. I hope you enjoy. I had fun painting this, and I think it turned out... I'm really happy with the improvements I was able to make and glad that I stuck in there and gave this one another shot. Thank you for watching. Thanks for watching.